reality that anything that is of God cannot die. Live here with the mentality that anything of God cannot suffer decadence. Anything of God cannot suffer calamity and catastrophe. Number two reason why I say there is hope for the church is because God's desire for the church is to be fruitful and multiply. God's desire for the church is to be fruitful and multiply. Acts chapter 12 and verse 24, the Bible said, and the word of God grew and multiplied. Another translation says, the word of God grew and leaped in bounds. It grew by leaps and it grew by bounds. The word of the Lord. Hear me, sir. Even in creation, Genesis 1, 28, God blessed them and said, be multiply, uh, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fishes of the sea, the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moved upon the face of the earth. God again placed demand on humanity to multiply. Multiplication is not an advice, it's a command. In Genesis chapter 9 verse 1, God said to Noah, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Again he said to Abraham, and he said, in Genesis 35 and verse 11, and God said unto him, I am the God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy lungs. Your God is not a static God. Anywhere he meets men, he increases them. You will not be the first to decrease. In the mighty name of Jesus. So I want you to know that it is not just that there is hope for you because we want to say there is hope for you. But because Jesus said it and now God is saying it. In Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7. The Bible said the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and was exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them. Sir, the sons of Israel multiplied greatly. They became exceedingly mighty. So they filled the land. So I want you to know that not only did Jesus said he will build his church, not only that God said he will grow his church, but why I say there is hope for the church and for you is number three, God revitalizes people and church and nation. There is hope for you because God revitalizes people. He revitalizes church. He revitalizes nation. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 to 5. He said, nevertheless, I am somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. He said, remember therefore from where else thou hast fallen. And repent. And do the first work. Or else I will come unto thee quickly. And remove the candlestick out of this place. Out of his place. Except thou repent. He said, remember that where thou hast fallen, repent and do the first works. God still revitalizes people. He still revitalizes churches. Even if you have missed it, God said, repent. Once you do that, he said, I, I go back to the first work. What was the first revelation? What was the first word he gave you? What was that rema? That catapulted you to begin. He said, go back to the first works. Many began ministry with good motive. But their motive was polluted and corrupted. And because their motive was polluted and corrupted, they lost focus. God is saying, even if you have lost focus, even if you have lost steam, he said, go back to your first work. He said, I will come on to thee quickly. If you refuse, I will come and take away the candlestick. Hear me, sir. The churches in the days of the apostles after the death of the apostles, 
uh, were stagnant. So Jesus came to instruct them to return to their first love so that he can revive them. So I am safe to say at this moment that God still revives. That is why there is hope. The Bible says, if a tree be cut down, yea, through the scent of water, it shall burn again. I don't care what is happening to your life. You can bounce back again. Who told you it is finished? Who told you everything is off? You can still bounce back again. Somebody shout, I hear. I hear. I am one pastor that believes that anybody can bounce back. I hear you, sir. Anybody can bounce back. If you see my hand here, I put one of the singer. Everybody was running down. He has repented. He has asked for forgiveness to his wife. His church has suspended him three months and restored him. Why is the church still trying to treat him like a leper? I said to him, come up. Come up. Let me use the grace of my life and project you. Let the whole world see you again. Who told you that once you fall, you are falling forever? God still revitalizes. God still revives. Yes, sir. I thank God that God is not man. Some of you will never be called to ministry. God is not man. Some of you will never be anointed. But I thank God that man, God does not see as man sees. He looked at the heart. If only you can be determined, you can still bounce back again in the mighty name of Jesus. And I prophesy to every ministry, hearing the sound of my voice, as you have come to this three-day school of ministry, let something jump out of your spirit. Amen. Let there be a reaction that we bat a testimony. Amen. Let there be a reaction that we bat a testimony. Amen. Can I hear somebody shout that amen like a thunder? Amen. I pray for you. I receive it, sir. You will bounce back. Amen. I didn't like your amen. I say you'll bounce back. Amen. Why is hope important for your ministry? Why is hope important for your ministry? Because, sir, if you don't have hope, you are finished. A living dog is better than a dead lion. You can be a lion the day you lose hope. God summarizes your ministry. God can never manage a man who has no hope. The moment Elijah, Elijah said, I am tired. Let me die. I am not better than my masters. God says, summarize your ministry. I cannot use a man who have lost hope. Because your message is to give hope to the world. Now, you, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are manifesting on a hopeless foundation. Who will you recover? Who will you bring to God? A man by the name Victor Franklin was in prison during the Second World War in a, a concentration camp in Germany. Child of God, while he was still in that concentration camp, he was studying why people survive in prison. Why people survive in prison, especially long time sentence. So we were there, he was there in that, in, that, in that prison. He met people who were there for 35 years, 40 years, 30 years, 25 years, 50 years in prison. And some died in prison. He said, after long years of study, he came out with this conclusion. He said, all of them who died in prison lost hope. All of them, he said, 90% of all of them who came out of prison after a long-term jail term was because they entered prison with hope that one day they will come out. It doesn't matter how. They may not see it. They may not imagine it. Please take care of that. They may not imagine it. And yet, because there is hope, something kept them going. And they lived on. And they served their prison jail. I'm sorry. And they came out. My friend, if you lose hope, you have lost ministry. I'm telling you. With hope, nothing can die. With hope, you can still strive. Hope one day. Every morning, shout, my lines are falling onto me in pleasant places. Every morning you wake up, it is working. You may stumble on one light that will change your entire ministry. You may stumble on one association that will turn, turn your life around. Some, their life change in process. Some, their life change in a cataclysmic way. 
There are ministries that change in process. There are also ministries that changes in a cataclysmic way. Sir, I want to ask you a very strong question. Do you believe that there is hope for your ministry? Do you believe, believe. there is hope for your ministry? Yes, sir. Now let me tell you why people lose hope. When members give up on you, when your leaders give up on you, the tendency to, give, give, uh, to lose hope is there. When people stop believing in you, the tendency to lose hope is there. But can I tell you, sir? All of this is at the mercy of the state of your mind. Anybody can lose hope. It is not the conclusion until you have lost hope. So, hear me. The disrespect, disregard, and lack of faith people have for you is not as important as the hope you have for yourself. Because whatever anybody feels about you is at the mercy of the state of your faith and hope. Yes, sir. So please, don't give up your hope. Don't give up your faith. Stay on. And I want to give you about four reasons why there is people uh, 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 give up their vision and give up their hope. I call it the four folks. Fox covering a pastor's vision. When I say fox, you know in the developed country, the early hours of the morning, some folks will just come up. That is uh, what they call it, dews. Dews cover everywhere. People can't see. Can't see beyond their nose. It does happen most time in Canada. Some part of cold areas in the U.S. You will see that. Now, many pastors can't see hope in their churches. They seem to have a, a fog covering their sides. And because they can't see they will not be able to believe God for what is ahead of them. Number one fog you must deal with that covers the pastor from having hope that can't see his vision is the fog of fatigue. Fatigue. When you labor too much and you are tired, you will seem to lose hope. You do two steps to breakthrough, 15 steps to prosperity. You fasted 40 days. You saw the principle of Kenehagen. You applied it. You applied the principle of T.L. Osborne. Yes. You applied the principle of Joel Austin. You applied the principle of Bishop Oyedepo. And you are still at that moment. You get so tired and fatigued. Please. You must always get to where you can be refreshed. Find your own assembly. Don't go to places where you attend and you are totally intimidated. Instead of being fired, you are intimidated. That is not where your hope will come from. Your hope should come from meetings where somebody speaks to you and it quickens you. Until you are alive, you can't take greater challenges. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying here? Yes, sir. Because even the little challenges are already swallowing you up. Somebody got to tell you that this little challenge, you can overcome it. This little challenge, you can swallow it. This little challenge, you can, you can, you can bury it. Is somebody hearing what God is saying to us? Yes, so, the, the fog of fatigue is one of the powerful militating force to our vision. It covers our side when you get tired. I've, I, I've been around nations. I've been to over 40 nations preaching. And I've met pastors who are tired. They did everything they knew how to do. And so they begin to give up. They begin to, if, especially in the developed country, they start looking for jobs. After COVID, you need to know how tens of thousands of churches in America have closed down. After COVID, tens of thousands of churches have closed down. Why? The pastors are tired. They have given up. The next fog is the fog of frustration. Very, they are so frustrated. They lose patience. They are so frustrated. Frustrated by being isolated by others. There's nothing as frustrated as when your mates are making it in ministry and succeeding. They are into thousands. You can't invite them. They can't even talk to you. You can't talk to them. When you try to talk to them, they, there's so much barriers and wall. I know that frustration. That, but that's why the Bible says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That is why, sir, you must rely on what he told you. 
Because, sir, if you take your inspiration from people, you will die without mercy. You must take your inspiration from God and his word. You must have a fountain from the spirit where you, you draw from. Otherwise, you will be frustrated. If nobody comes for you, hold yourself. Encourage yourself. If the guest speakers fail to come, be the guest speaker. Preach. Preach. Because in truth, people don't come most times for the guest speaker. They come for you. They come for you. 100%, 90% of the people who come for your meeting, they come for you. Only 10% come for the guest speaker. So I don't want you at any point to give up. And no guest speaker can grow your church. Nobody brings guest speaker like me. I have come to a conclusion by experience that no guest speaker can grow your church. The only thing a guest speaker does is to validate your work, number one. Is to give you acceptance before people who are still doubting the validity of your call. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying here? Is to open the heart of certain ranking men in the society. That's all. But the power that brings them here is at the mercy of your, of your weightiness in the realm of the spirit. So instead of relying on guest speaker, build your weight. Build your weight. The next fork is the fork of fear. Many pastors are too afraid to dare. And many sons that I have helped in the past and I'm and still helping that are really growing and picking up is the first thing I did from them is destroying fear. They fear to take risk. They fear to take certain steps. And me, I have lost fear a long time ago. I don't fear anything. I don't need money to do ministry. I just need to take a step. That's all. Anything I want to get done, it can be done if you lose fear. Hear me, sir. Fear invites Satan. And faith invites God. Never be afraid to take certain steps. At all. A young man wanted to buy land. He said he's so afraid. He doesn't know what he, he was going to do. And uh, the money are coming in tickles. I said to him, start. Look for a land and be paying small, small. As we speak, last year I went to dedicate the church. Church is finished. Everywhere sealed. And the work is ready. And when we went, the work has started growing. He said to me, he didn't know it was like that. He even feared to bring me. Because he didn't have money. You need to see the committee meeting he had to pay my hotel bill. I had to ask somebody to pay the hotel bill. He should pay later because I can't wait for him anymore. So we took certain steps. And he discovered he can do it. I take authority over every fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of, 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 of the future. Fear of insufficiency. Fear to fail. I command it to die in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want you to steer up your spirit. Not to give up. Not to give up. Another reason why there is folk is small mentality. Small mentality. And I discovered that mentality is enlarged by three reason, by three uh, factors. Number one, by association. Number two, by traveling deep into God. By traveling deep into God. Because when you travel deep into God, your mentality gets altered. Another way you, you alter your mentality, child of God, not just by association, not just by traveling deep into God, but by acquiring information. Acquiring what? Information. Small mind, but small ministry. Expand your mentality. Have a mindset. There are four kinds of, three kinds of mindset. Let me mention one. Resolute mindset. You must have it as a pastor. When you look at Genesis chapter 38 and verse number 22, 28 to 30, the Bible says it came to pass when she travailed that the one put forth his hand and the midwife took and bound a, a, on his hand a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. I'm reading Genesis 38, 28. Now 29 says, and it came to pass as he drew back his hand that behold his brother came out and said, how has that broken forth? This bridge be upon thee. Therefore his name shall be called what? Feras. 
Afterward came out his brother that the, sack, that the scarlet thread was upon his hand and his name was called what? His name was called what? Sarah. So we discover that resolute mindset is a strong determination and purposefulness of heart. That mindset that says, I will win. I am born to win. That mindset that says, my breakthrough is sure. That mindset that said, I will, I will, it must end in testimony. That mindset that said, I won't die like this. That mindset that said, I will end this way. That mindset that said, I must succeed. That mindset that said, I will not die small. That mindset that said, by the grace of God, I will make it. That mindset that said, those who make it don't have 10 heads. Those who make it don't have 15 heads. Those who make it have one head. If they can succeed, I will succeed. That mindset that said, the people growing the ministry in this town, if it's working for them, it must work for me. There is no land that is a hard land. That is a mindset you must carry. Please, never work with people who carry the mindset of excusitis. They give excuses for why ministry is not working. The moment you advance excuses, ministry start dying in your hand. Ministry to succeed in your hand, you must have a zero tolerance for excuses. You have no excuses. Take responsibility for your personal growth and the growth of your ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 said, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all, but one receive the prize. So, so run that you may obtain. Run that you may obtain. Run with the mindset to obtain. Run with the mindset to have it. He said, run that you may obtain. And then the scripture went on to say, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Every man that strive for mastering is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible crown. Then the next verse says, I therefore so run. Now he didn't say we run. I therefore so run. Not as uncertainly. Not without hope. Not being unsure. But run with shorty, with this mentality that it will work. So fight I, not as one that beat the air. I fight with focus. I fight with resolve. I fight with resolute mind. Then the way I fight, if there's any obstacles, one of the obstacles is my flesh. Then Paul said, I put, I keep under my body. I bring it what? Into subjection. Least by enemies, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a castaway. Somebody say, resolute mind. Resolute mind. Shout it louder. Resolute mind. I pray for somebody here. I receive. Carry sir. that mentality. Amen. Of lion heartedness. Amen. The agility of an eagle. Amen. Carry that capacity. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Lift up your hands, say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of this Jesus. Mindset, this mindset. To strive, to strive, to win. To win. I, receive it now, I receive it now in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. So how do I deal with this fox that covers me? The fog of fear, fog of, 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 of what? Fatigue, frustration, and the fog of small mentality. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 9. As I round up, that is the first introduction to welcome you. Uh, we have not entered the proper materials yet. When I come the second time, we take in the main materials. Nevertheless, we made our prayers unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. We set a watch over them day and night because of them. So how do I keep hope alive? How do I deal with these folks? Number one, keep spiritual focus. Keep spiritual focus. He said, we set a watch. We pray. We pray. We made our prayers unto God. 
Talk to God about your life. Talk to God about your ministry. Take time to pray. Anybody who tells you that prayer is, is uh, outdated, is, is, is analog, you, you need digital, you need uh, cameras, you need a uh, screen, you, you, you need AC church. My friend, you can have all these things if there is no deposit of prayer. One devil will end your church. One attack will cripple your destiny. I am telling you, so the first thing you must do in order to take away the fog, the lack of vision, the fear, the frustration, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to prayer. Number two, set a watch. What do I mean by set a watch? Manage the process. Manage the process. Revive yourself. Revive yourself. Sir, to turn your church around, you must turn yourself around. To turn your church around, you must turn yourself around. You can never grow, you can never grow your church beyond your growth. Anytime your church is stagnant, it's because you are stagnant. If you don't grow yourself, you can never grow your church. So revive yourself. You must have a big dream so that your church will have a big dream. As the pastor, so is the church. As the pastor, so is the church. The next thing, child of God, in managing the process, not just revive yourself, but keep the big picture. Keep the big picture. See the fulfillment of the vision with the big picture. Don't let the problem of the ministry consume you. Maintain. See the end of the matter more than the beginning. See the end of the matter more than the process. Look for the product. Don't look for the process. Look out for your manifestation. Forget about the transition. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Don't give up on yourself. Be persistent because your breakthrough will manifest any moment from now. Can I hear somebody shout out amen like a thunder? Amen. The next thing is develop a learning posture. Develop a learning posture. We are talking about managing the manage the process. Set a watch. Develop a learning process. Remember that leaders are readers. Leaders are readers. If your shoes are more than your books, you don't have a future. If your clothes are more than your books, as a pastor, you don't have a future. Even when Paul was about to be sentenced to death, he said, bring me my parchment. Bring me my books. Even when he knew that he was going to die, he was still a learner. Even at his dead end, he was still learning. No wonder that guy wrote one third of the New Testament, more than half of the New Testament. Hear me, develop a, le a learning posture. There are many pastors in Abuja whose ministry is dying in their hand. They saw this program, but they are not ready to learn. They are not ready to learn. My friend, go where you can improve your mentality. Go where you can improve your spirituality. Pay any amount to grow yourself. The next thing you must do in managing the process, set a goal for your church. Nothing happens until you write it down. Write down the goals for your church. Because, sir, we are going to achieve two things in this school of ministry. It's going to be a bit academic and it's going to be very spiritual. So, two things. There are a few speakers that will come in the spiritual dimension and others that will come in the academic dimension. That does not mean the ones who come in the academic dimension are not spiritual. That does not mean the one who comes from the spiritual dimension are not academic. No, sir. We are going to spread it like that for the purpose of building buoyancy. Because, sir, you can't build your church only by spirituality. Hear me, sir. There are things you need to know to grow. Because if you don't know them, you will grow. There are things you need to do to expand. And this thing we are going to be sharing is applicable to business. It's applicable to your job. It's applicable to whatever you are doing. That you Anything that needs to grow, this conference and this seminar is for you. I welcome you to a new day. I come, welcome you to a new season. 
I declare, by the time we shall be done on Friday, nothing will die in your hand. Amen. Something will break forth in your life. Amen. There will be a release in the spirit Amen. that will favor your cause. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Stand on your feet and begin to articulate it in prayer. Say, Father, I thank you. There is hope for me. Nothing will die in my hand. There is hope for my ministry. There is hope for my business. Nothing will die in my hand. In the mighty name of Jesus, I refuse to give it. I refuse to give up. Open your mouth and begin to pray. I refuse to give it. I refuse to give up. I refuse to give it. I refuse to give up. Articulate it in prayer. Shake it in prayer. Talaba sambradaka, luski payada daba sombrehate, luka payanda bo sikerendo shikaya, raka katonde gebala bo shikerende. Masatayada, Rekeponde Kapayada Bashanta. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I refuse to give in. I refuse to give up. Lada Bakan, pray, 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 pray. I refuse to give him. I refuse to give him. Mandala Prada Labashata, Barada Labaradado Sata, Mandala Prasata Labada, Sata La Prada Labada, Sata La Prada Labada, Sata La Prada there is hope for me. There is hope for my ministry. There is hope for my future. In the name of Jesus, I refuse to give it. I refuse to give it. I refuse to surrender. In the name of Jesus, my lines are falling unto me. In places and places, I have a good heritage. Begin to speak hope, begin to speak life into your life, into your ministry. Speak hope, speak life. be open. Amen. As we enjoy three to four sections every day of this school of ministry. Yes, open our heart. Amen. Give us the discipline to sit down. Amen. And hear another speak to us. Amen. Give us the insight to indict a good matter. Amen. And abilities to consume mysteries. Amen. 
give us access to light. Amen. Our heart is open. Amen. Our spirit is open. Yes, Lord. Speak, Lord. Yes, Lord. Speak, Lord. Yes, Lord. Speak, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let God's people shout out amen like a thunder. Amen. So, bring the second word on productive growth. He's a son of mine that has been with me for over 30 years. So I want him to bring this word, the productive word, productive growth, sorry. With Jesus' joy, help me welcome Apostle Paul Odola. Give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. You wait, you wait, you are mighty on your throne. Amen. And amen. While you remain standing, let's appreciate the Lord with a big hand, everybody. What a wonderful word from our father, our mentor, our leader, the president of Emova, the general overseer of the Shepherd House, my own personal pastor and father. Please, let's appreciate Reverend Dr. Joshua Talina with a big, 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 big hand. Please, you may be seated. I want to personally thank you, sir, for this opportunity given me to bring this very important word at this second section. It was a wonderful opening ceremony for this uh, Imofa section, and it could have been taken by no other but our father. I have gone around the world. I have not seen a man yet who has sincere hunger to develop young ministers and equally give them opportunity. I have not seen any yet like Reverend Dr. Joshua Telina. And for some of you, you must attest to that. <laughs> there is a gentleman, for that reason, let's celebrate a very rare gem, a very rare general. You can't sit down doing that. Please, let's honor him. Thank you, sir, for being such a great leader. Somebody say amen. Please be seated. It's for such reason I have followed for almost 30 years. And my life has been the better for it. I have no cause to change course. He has all I need and he has all that is required. Somebody say amen. In the next 40 minutes thereabout, I want to take us on the second section. If you have the opportunity to come to this conference, at the end of it, you'll be surely glad because deep truths, not just, not just knowledgeable truth, but experiential truth will be delivered to you. Somebody say amen. Please turn your Bible with me to the book of John chapter 21 from verse number 16. I will take my major text from there. John chapter 21 from verse number 16. I will just take my text from there. John 21, 16. Can we read it together? I want to go, everybody. And he said to him again, the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, yeah, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, do what? Feed my sheep. Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, I ask for wisdom and I ask for utterance that by the end of this teaching, our minds will be renewed, our spirits will be quickened, our bodies will be transformed in Jesus' precious name. And everybody say amen. amen. All right, permit me to continue on the second series after Papa has spoken on productive pastoring or pastoring for growth. But let me zero it on productive pastoring. Say it again. Productive pastoring is still a subtopic in pastoring without tears. How to pastor productively. Let me start by saying this, that when your motive for pastoring is wrong, you cannot get the right result. Peter was the first pastor that Jesus ever chose. Peter was the first pastor that Jesus ever chose. 
And before he was choosing, his motive was scrutinized. His motive was investigated. His motives were questioned three times until he became offended. Peter, lovest thou me? He said, yes, I do. Peter, lovest thou me? He said, yes, I do. Peter, are you sure you love me? And he said, Jesus, but you know. He said, it is on that platform that sincere feeding of the sheep can be guaranteed. Of course, it is very natural like it is. When, when I say this with due respect, when animals are properly fed, growth is natural. Multiplication is natural. So, you will not be able to succeed in pastoring when your motive is not the love of Jesus. And can I say this to you? Don't be deceived that your motive can be continuous. Because of the dynamics of ministry, sometimes our motives get corrupted on transit. That is where you stagnate. That is where problems unsolvable begins to emerge. That is when you become fatigued. That is when you become discouraged. Every time your motive is out of place, you will be displaced. In fact, let me say this to you. 90% of the problems in ministry are motive related. It's the reason resident pastors break pastors' churches. It's the reason for insubordination. It is the reason for theft and stealing in church. It is the reason for the pull-down syndrome. So, successful pastoring begins with the right motive. The right motive. And your motive is not right until the love of Jesus is the cornerstone for your pastoring. Love us down me. If I'm talking somewhere side here. If I'm talking somewhere side here. Love us down me. Love us down me. So you must understand that motive, as we have gathered today, and we will be in the next two, three days. Let's investigate our motives. Let's question the motive for which we do what we do. Let's be able to place our motive right then any subsequent step taken will be the right step. Somebody say amen. So, what is productive pastoring? Productive pastoring is impactful pastoring. It is impactful pastoring. It is impactful pastoring. Impactful pastoring is a pastoring that transforms lives and changes destinies. Impactful pastoring. Don't fall into the temptation where all manners of publicity is done to gather people and they are raided. Every service and activity is a raiding moment. Gather them, gather them, gather them, gather them. Let's collect their money. Gather them, gather them, gather them, gather them. Let them fall on the ground. Gather. Let a productive pastoring is how many lives have been changed under my pastoral care? Who came poor and now is rich? Who came as a drunkard now is a sound disciple? Who came as an immoral disjointed fellow and now has direction. If you can't stand from the altar and point one, two, three, four, five, six, my brother, you are not pastoring, you are a gangster. Some are here. Some are here. I say this as my very personal opinion. I have deliberately not been found in the attitude of looking for rich people. If your anointing cannot raise one, the rich one you are looking for, you are begging for disrespect. 
You are setting up yourself for disrespect. Because somebody you are not part of his growth, you can't share his fruit with a reckless abandon. Productive pastoring is changing lives. So if you can't count one, two, three, four, five, like, like I want to say this, you know, I have a pastor, and uh, Dr. Joshua Terina is my pastor. There is nothing he will do in my life that can be offended. You know why? Every stage and phase, he has pastored me through it. I'm just glad he has never asked for all my accounts. It has been given. There is nothing I have that he has not shown me the way. So I'm talking about changing life. He knows how he met me 30 years ago. Reckless, useless, focusless barrack boy that had no regard for persons. That is pastoring. That is pastoring. Somebody say, here. Yeah. It's an impactful pastoring. That is productive pastoring. Galatians chapter 4 verse number 19. Paul speaking said, my little children, let me paraphrase it because of time, of whom I travail. My little children of whom I travail in bed again until. Let's leave it. That is pastoring. You are not tired. No, until all this impatience and desperation with people and lack of ability to accommodate, then you will fail in pastoring. Travel until. Travel until. That is why the general team for our gathering as pastoring with that yes is just is just an affirmism just to let you know that you can actually not have tears but there's a lot of tears travel until who have you traveled until you can say i, I can see my hand work in this life Until Christ be formed. Who have you formed into an identity? Who have you formed into a responsible personality? Who have you formed Christ in? You see, when you don't understand this very basic truth, is the reason for pastoral insecurity. Because anybody you are responsible for his formation, no matter where he goes, he won't suffer deformation. No matter who he hears, he will suffer deformation. So I'm talking about impactful pastoring. It is the transforming of lives. It is the changing positively of destinies. Number two. Productive pastoring is relevant pastoring. Now you must be able to separate from reigning and relevance. Don't reign, be relevant. Don't reign, be relevant. Productive pastoring is relevant pastoring. You are relevant in every season, in every dispensation, in every generation. You are very relevant. It means you are pastoring productively. Not the one. And you see, when you understand this, you will not be copying things that makes people reign. You'll be looking for values that make people relevant. Some are here. Some are here. When you understand relevance, you will not be looking for things that makes people rain. And that is why I don't discuss reigning pastors. I discuss relevant pastors. There is no wave you see today that has not been seen before. So I'm not talking about somebody who just came on the scene one month ago, two years ago. No, 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 no. I'm talking about the one that has been there 20 years. With some dimension of consistency. 
with some dimension of durability. That is the one I want to talk about. Let this one stand the test of time. Others can talk about him. Somebody say here. Somebody say here. Otherwise, you will quickly lose focus because you think somebody is raining. Look at what 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, 7 says. Let's look at it quickly, please. This is a training moment. It's not preaching as it were. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse number 7. Notwithstanding the Lord. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7, not 17. 7, 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. Thank you. I have fought a good fight of it. I have finished my course. Don't envy a man who is only in the second course and there is seven to go. Don't. Don't. I was talking with due respect. I don't mean any harm just because I just wanted you to be edified. I was talking, when a friend was talking to me about a particular man of God and I said to him, he's doing so well. I envy him, admire him, but let's wait when he gets married because it's another phase of a course. It's another phase of a course. Let him marry first. Somebody say, here, 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 here. Let's talk about a man who has finished all his courses. I have finished, put my scripture there. I have finished my course. I have fought. Don't envy a man who has not met a lion yet. No, 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 no. Has his church been broken apart and he can still stand? Has he fought that? Finish my course. I have kept the faith. Relevance through all battles. Relevance through all causes. Relevance through all misfortune of doctrines. He kept faith. That is productive pastoring. Somebody say here. Somebody say here. Because you see, one of the things I've observed is that every now and then there are new description of faiths and explanation of faiths in all dimensions. Keep the faith. So I'm talking about relevant pastoring. Look at this. Titus chapter 3 verse number 8. Relevant pastoring is what guarantees productive pastoring. Don't seek to reign. Seek to be relevant. Seek to be relevant. If you seek to reign, you become a victim of deceptions. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain. Somebody say maintain. Maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. I'm talking about maintaining relevance. Maintaining good works. Maintaining good works. That is productive pastoring. Maintaining good works. Number three, productive pastoring is successful pastoring. You will never be productive if you are not thinking of the next successor. You must understand that ministry has an element of posterity. It can start with you. It should not by any means end with you. So therefore, on this note, I want to say some very deep truths. Without equivocation. By the liberty given to me by our father. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2, for the purpose of time, let me summarize. It said that which you have heard, Second Timothy chapter 2, verse number 2. That which you have heard of me, he said, commit. And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same. Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to equally teach others. Excuse me, sir. In productive pastoring, you must have faithful men that can continue the pattern as it was given to you. And I think this is where 
we need to do exegesis because by the virtue of the happenings of our times and our season, a lot of people are afraid to think of successors. That you are thinking about a successor is not a guarantee for premature death. It's just that it gives you more rest before your final rest. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. If you are not there, who is there? Is there any faithful? That is productive. Let me say this very quickly. If there is nobody within your children, as it were, that you can comfortably leave a vacuum for, you have never been productive. I say this, please take this. Because productivity is that there are faithful men following you. For me. Whole thought for me. Whole thought for me. If you can point to such a person, you have not been actually proud enough to represent you in your absence. Hello? Are we together? Are we together? Are we together? They prove that you have been meticulous, deliberate, Calculative in pastoring is to raise faithful and able and available men. Otherwise, you have never been productive. You have been running the theater and you are the main actor. Somebody say, here. Somebody say, here. You must understand that ministry is ministry and it has a pattern. It must be done the way it can be done. Productive pastoring is pastoring and understanding that as you are pastoring, there are faithful people being raised. Now, let me say this to you, which is very important. I must say this. It is very key. It's very key. When you have conferences, when you have seminars, when you have crusades and convention, it is usually okay to bring men of different giftings for the purpose of complementation. Because whether you know it or not, nobody knows it all. We all know in part and we prophesy in part. So it's acceptable in such moments. But in a normal, unavoidable circumstances where you are away, if you bring a stranger, it's an indictment on your egocentrism. If a stranger in a simple being absence is the one holding forth for you, then all the people you have taught in five years, you actually didn't teach them. Teach them. You were doing paparazzi. If you really taught them in five years, give them platform, let them make their mistakes. They will improve later. Somebody say productive pastoring. Hello, are you here? Please, are you here? Please, are you here? My father used to say before he died, he said when a man travels and comes back, the state of his house is an indication of how it will be when he dies. So if in a simple journey there is nobody responsible enough, faithful and able enough to stand in your absence, nobody prays for death, but it does happen. So visitors will visit your church on the rapture. Hello, are you here? Hello, are you here? So therefore, in productive pastoring, it's important that faithful, capable, available, and able men are product of your pastoring. It's very key. It's very important. That is a proof that you are truly pastoring. That is a proof that you have made impact. That is a proof that truly you are doing that which is required and which is important. Otherwise, it means all of them have been malnourished lacking the ability and capacity to fill in your absence. All of them have been underdeveloped, lacking ability to stand in your absence. And probably sometimes it's an, it's an evidence of your insecurity as a visionless pastor. That there is fake currency must not stop you from using the real Naira. There are rascal children does not mean you can't trust some with responsibility. 
Somebody say, yeah. I think one of the things our ministries and churches need to move away from is empirism. The mentality of trying to build an empire of a one-man show. It is not productive pastoring. There are ministries that are doing so well today and they should be our yardstick. Looking at them from afar, you can easily tell the line of succession. Why are you away and everybody's confused what to do next? In the order of leadership, if a member sit down and cannot easily see through it, then you are not pastoring properly. So therefore, there are things that qualify for productive pastoring and I want to run through them quickly because you see, this Imofa conference is meant to position us. We are in a generational shift. If you didn't learn it from COVID, then you are in the Old Testament. It's very important to understand that. Something shifted in COVID and you must be deliberate about how ministry is being done. Somebody say amen. I know a pastor friend of mine that COVID, the, the COVID just happened. He couldn't leave Germany for four months. The church closed in Lagos. He's starting afresh. Because he thought he would just go and do one week and come back. And then there was lockdown for four months. Nobody know who to do next. No authority. No clear succession. See, some things should be clear even if they are not written. Nobody know who next. The wife, newly married, have no authority of her own yet. Church closed down because of contention of leadership. He just started afresh. So in productive pastoring, these are the things to imbibe. Number one, pattern must be clear. Pattern must be clear. You can never be productive until pattern is clear. Set Exodus chapter 25, verse number 9. Exodus chapter 25, verse number 9. And God said to Moses, make sure every building is according to the pattern. According to all that I've shown thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all instruments thereof, even so shall you make of it. Every ministry must have a recognizable, transferable, knowledgeable pattern. What is the pattern of this ministry? You must have a pattern. In fact, productivity becomes very difficult when pattern is not clear. Is it a teaching ministry? Is it a prophetic ministry? Is it an apostolic ministry? You must, pattern must be clear. Otherwise, everything goes, goes nowhere. A patternless ministry is a futureless ministry. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. If your ministry is hope, to the world, then it will be, I want to say this please, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. If your ministry is hope to the world, then it's understandable if you bring comedians to inspire people to laugh and then have hope. There is a dimension of ministry, any comic effect destroys substance. You must have a pattern. Oh no, one, one comedian is raining, they brought him in that church and people gather, then you bring him, ask yourself, your kind of pattern does he accommodate comedy? Otherwise, they will laugh and erode the foundation you have laid already. They will come and mess up your teaching in comedy and then your member doesn't take what you have just preached serious. It is good. All things are good. They are only right in the context of pattern. So all this mixture, all this mixture becomes the order when pattern is not clear. They ask, I say this with respect, they ask Bishop Oedipo one of the times, you have not brought 
Bishop T.D. Jakes to your altar. He says, a wonderful man of God, an exciting preacher, but our pattern does not tolerate uh, uh, God. And the touch agreement, God. Is that we singing you know, or teaching? Sir, if you don't have pattern, every reigning preacher will climb to your altar. That they are reigning does not mean you necessarily need them. Somebody say, yeah. Somebody say, yeah. So, pattern actually is the bedrock for productivity. If they mention your name and your pattern is not easily clear, then something is wrong with your approach to ministry. If they mention your ministry name and pattern is not immediately clear, then there is something with your approach to ministry. It's very key. Of course, some of you understand our fathers of faith. I say this with due respect on this altar. If you mention deeper life, pattern becomes clear. If you mention living faith, pattern becomes clear. If you mention Christ's embassy, patterns become clear. You, they have mentioned your name. They can't tell what is the pattern. Somebody say here. Any member that is not formed cannot understand duplication. If they don't have a pattern, they can't reproduce after their kind. They have no kind. Let me set and say this, please. When members have no pattern, they don't have a kind. When they have no kind, they can reproduce after their kind. There must be a pattern that members can take and reproduce after their kind. Come to our church, you will become like this. Here, my pastor, you will ultimately be this. It is pattern that guarantees multiplication. Somebody say here. Somebody say here. Most recently, I was challenged, actually. I think I was talking with Papa. We started a church recently in a particular city here. Uh, and then a couple of members just, just relocated from other parts of Nigeria and then came to where we were and came to church. People of God, I didn't need anybody to tell me they were well-trained. First timers, the impact was clear. First timers. Walked into my office, pastor, I'm just being posted. I just said, uh, it's a new church. What can I really do? I can do this, 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 and that. Which department do you want to give me? And then before he left, he gave me an envelope. I am not permitted to see my pastor for the first time without an exchange. I asked him, who trained you? I need that manual. <laughs> Some of you, if your members ever go to somewhere, they will be the problem you created them to be. Somebody say here. Yes, 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 yes. They will be the same. Can, can, can anybody leave your church and enter a church where you were not? And the pastor say, come, whoever trained you did well. Pattern. Pattern. Some pastors were driven from certain ministries. Another pastor was waiting to collect them full hand. Because he knows a redundant pastor in that ministry is an asset in another. Training. You, if we drive you here, we can't even recommend you to another. So, productive pastoring begins with pattern. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. Number two, you productive pastoring demands delegation. 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 If you don't understand delegation, you will die of exhaustion. It's not a prophecy. It's an advice. Exodus chapter 17 verse 9. I saw something Moses said. Exodus 17 verse 9. Please, when my time is up, I'll just need a five-minute signal so that we can have Papa come again. I've been enjoying what he teaches. Somebody say Amen. Exodus chapter 17, verse number 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us, choose us out men, and go out, fight with the Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hands. The rod of God is the word of God. If you don't delegate, you will lose focus in the word. I will hold the rod. Do the fighting we 
where finances is consigned. Do the fighting where evangelism is consigned. Do the fighting where welfare is consigned. Do the fighting. I will hold the rod. You want to be everywhere, everything, and everything. Excuse me, please. It's the reason why people burn out. You, there's nobody you can choose. You are the only person choosing. Productive pastoring is delegation. Even the apostle said that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 6, verse number 3. He said, we shall choose men from among us and delegate the works of the table. We, we shall give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayers. Every pastor who does everything will never be good at anything. Delegate. Please delegate. Please delegate. It guarantees productivity. It guarantees multiplication. In delegation, actually you multiply your kind because everyone that undertakes an assignment given to you partake of your same spirit. Everyone who undertake an assignment given to you partake of your same spirit. Not the spirit of God. And Moses took of his own spirit and impacted. Every mandate has a spirit. Anyone you give an assignment partake of that spirit. So you multiply your kind. Delegate. It enables productivity. Somebody say amen. Number three. Papa made mention of it but I want you just to emphasize it. Intercession. Number two, delegation. Number three, intercession for productivity in ministry. For productivity and multiplication in ministry, intercession. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. See what intercession is. Intercession guarantees for refreshment. And Jesus left the multitude by the side. You, you want to be with people all the time. Jesus left and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he went there alone. The purpose for intercession is refreshment. Refresh your spirit. In the place of refreshment, you can guarantee achievement. In the place of refreshment, you can guarantee attainment. In the place of refreshment, you can guarantee achievement. Refresh. Spiritual refreshment boosts your immunity against satanic attack. I have followed Papa for 30 years. Well, maybe Mama can tell a different story. I have never seen him discouraged. In 30 years, I have seen him in the worst of moments. I have seen him in the thick of battles. I have seen him in very trouble sometimes. The man has never been discouraged. I think that is where I learned that from him. Because sometimes I just want to find out how does discouragement look like. Let me be discouraged a little. Let me just know how people feel. Because I followed a man that has never been discouraged. Dr. Joshua Telina, never been discouraged. Intercession. See, everybody is sick. The reason your own has not shown is the so much of humanity. Everybody is sick. The reason you are not on admission is your immunity. When immunity is more than malady, you stay strong. Yes. But when immunity is broken down, typhoid fever becomes, becomes like a cancer. That is what they call HIV. Broken down immunity. Many of you are HIV positive in the spirit. <laughs> Little things, you are crying over them. Little things, like Papa will say, excuse is this. You are giving excuses. My city is difficult. The people are not coming to church. Nobody wants to give. Every day you have excuses. You are suffering from spiritually deficient immunity. What is making you complain? People are seeing it and excited. I'm progressing. The reason you are giving for stagnation, somebody is excited. Somebody's excitement is bringing progress. The same people you say does don't, they don't give. Somebody else came and collected and you are shocked. And when your immunity is strong, sir, divinity finds expression. When your spiritual immunity is strong, divinity finds expression. Check 
out. He left the people, he drove them away, went to the mountain and prayed. They, every time he returns, he returns in power. Demons saw him and groan. The blind saw. Cripples walk because he had come from the place of refreshment. Power found the expression cheaply. You, you have no moment of spiritual refreshment. You have no moment of intercession. I'm not talking about declaration and I'm not talking about confession. I'm talking about intercession. I will not be sick. I will not be poor. All those ones are declaration and confessions. The church will grow. Every declaration without a backup intercession, we suffer lack of manifestation. Are you here? Every declaration without a backup intercession, we suffer lack of manifestation. Did you see what Elijah said to uh, Ahab? Run! I hear the sound of abundance. I hear the sound of abundance. When Ahab took off, Elijah went to the mountain to put his head in between his knees to create what he has declared. Every declaration without a backup intercession will lack manifestation. All this, I will not be sick. One is waiting for you. Don't go and intercede. So in the place of intercession, you get refreshment. In the place of refreshment, it boosts your spiritual immunity. And when spiritual immunity is in place, divinity finds expression cheaply. Somebody say, I hear. Somebody say, I hear. Let's run very quickly. The other point for productive pastoring, friends, is self-development. Is self-development. Is self-development. Is self-development. Don't look for opportunity. Develop capacity. Opportunities will come naturally. Don't. 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 That is where some of you are very angry in mentorship and followership. You are following because you want them to give you open doors. And I, Papa Telina has a lot of connections. If I become his sons, I will be going around. Excuse me, it's a misplaced priority. Don't. Somebody say amen. Don't seek for opportunity. Develop capacity. It's very important. And in developing capacity, the question you ask yourself is, there are 24 hours in a day. There are 31 days in a month. There are 12 months in a year. To what do you give yourself often to? What do you give yourself often to? Acts of the Apostles chapter 6 verse 4. For we shall give ourselves to the ministry of the word and to prayer. The question is in self-development. What do you give yourself to? Because what you give yourself to will ultimately show and continuously show in your life. What do you give yourself to? Because you see, sometimes you think you have idle time. I used to tell my pastors, you see, sometimes you think, oh, in my office hours, members don't come all the time, so I can afford to be watching television. Excuse me, every idle moment is self-developing moment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Somebody told me a story very recently, very recently. The man was so shocked that he had to come and tell me the story. There was a security man guiding a particular house. And then he was living in the house and guiding the house. The owner practically was staying abroad and comes once in a year. This security man started reading where he was guiding. Enrolled in non Nigerian Open University. And as a security man, he became a graduate of economics. Then therein, he learned diverse skills. Guess what? Got employed and was coming back in the night to see the security work. And friends, he got into this Bitcoin stock, made so much money. Then he called his boss who hardly come around. He said, how much will the house I'm staying in for sale? How much will it cost? The boss said, who wants to buy it? He said, me. In your absence, I developed capacity that gave me prosperity. I want to own the house I have lived as a security man. The idle period without thieves was self-development. It was the reason David became a king. They dumped him with animals in the forest. He developed the skill of a catapult. He was not grumbling. He was not complaining. My pastor don't give me time to preach. I'm waiting for when they will give me time to preach. Excuse me, you may never see that time. Develop your capacity. Opportunity is waiting somewhere. So, 
So self-development guarantees pastoral productivity. That is very key. And let me quickly say this as I round up my five minutes getting close. In developing capacity, you must understand your dimension of calling and gifting. I'm closing on this note. You must understand your dimension of calling and gifting because it is important to understand that. My two chapter 25 verse number 15. You must understand the dimension of your calling and your gifting. There are people People that have been given one talent. There are others that have been given five. So in developing capacity, you ask yourself, am I a one talent person, a two talent person, or a five talent person? Because if you are a one talent person, stretching as a five talent person, you will stretch to death. And if you are a five talent person and you are not stretching beyond one talent, you will undermine potentials. You will undermine deposits. So you must know yourself. What kind of a person is my calling and my giftings? I used to tell people, I don't think I am a five talent person. I must tell you the truth because anything that is more than two, three, I get confused. So I understand I can do five talent things. There are people that have capacity city for churches in every city in every nation they can get report and be sleepless until the following day checking report me if it's more than two i have headache know your capacity and let me say this papa is already warming up know your capacity and be free from comparison Know your capacity and be free from comparison because they that compare themselves with themselves are not wise. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse number 12. Know your capacity. So in developing capacity, if it is one, you have one to develop. If it is two, you have two to develop. If it's five, you have five to develop. So what kind of capacity, ability, and giftings do you have? I prophesy to somebody here. Your capacity will find expression. Your divinity will find expression. If you believe that somebody said, here. I don't know if that is part of Papa's lectures, but let me say this. You must understand mentoring and fathering for two major reasons. In mentoring, you get inspiration. In fathership, you get instruction. They are very key to pastoral. Yes, sir. You must understand mentoring and fathering. Permit me to use my English. You must, if you must be productive in pastoring, you must. In mentoring, you have inspiration. In mentoring, there are people who have done what you are trying to do. So as you hear them, as you see them, as you observe them, you get inspiration. There are fathers. You must have a father for the purpose of instruction. You know why? There is a way that seemeth right to a man. The end is death. Sometimes in ministry, when you have nobody instructing you, there is something you think is very right. It will end your ministry. It's a trap. It's a trap. And that is one thing I've learned from Papa very strongly. Instructions. You must have somebody who instructs you. Proverbs 14, 12, and then Proverbs 4, 20, for the purpose of record. You must have instruction. You say, no, I have seen it is right. It may be right. The end is not. Only a father's instruction delivers you from it. Only a father's instruction. Most recently, I was planning to take off on a young man who actually has become a nuisance to my sanity. Then visiting Papa, he said to me, there are things you don't devote energy to. Ministry requires a lot. Don't be given to distraction. That for me, that was enough. Otherwise, I am not lacking in the arsenal to fight. But you see, in the place of instruction, sir, you find production. Stand your feet wherever you are. And in case you have no father, may today make you one. May God give you father, father enough, enough wisdom for Papa to father you. Lift up your hands. Say, Lord, I position myself. Please, one minute prayer. Say, Father, I position myself for productivity. That prayer must be sincere. Say it again. Say, Father, I position myself for productivity. Now!
Clap your hands and make that a prayer in one second. Rack up. I will be productive. I have no excuse to fail. I have no reason to be stagnant. I have no reason to be limited. I have no reason to be frustrated. I am productive. My capacity shall be developed. My opportunity shall show forth. Divinity shall find expression. Open your mouth and make that a prayer in the next one second. In the name of Jesus. May God give us results that will cause our generation to be outstanding. Amen. In Jesus' precious name. Will you bless these few moments? Father to child. With a clap and a shout. My father, Spirit. my teacher, my mentor, and our father, Lord. Reverend Dr. Lord. Joshua Lord. Telina. Lord. Let's honor him with a big, 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 big hand. Is that how to clap and celebrate? And with your breath of life, that's how I come alive. Oh, lift up your hands, let's I worship. Change my world. Everybody lift your hands right now. Sing for Father to child, spirit to spirit, spirit to spirit. Lighted by your word, lighted by your word. that is being impacted take all the glory in Jesus mighty name amen and let God's people shout that amen loud and clear amen, amen. you may be seated what a word let's celebrate apostle Paul Odola one more time <laughs> productive pastoring that is powerful the last section for today we are looking at the seven practical ingredients for church growth. Seven practical ingredients for church growth. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. Who then is Paul? Who then is Apollos? But ministers by whom Ye believed. Even the Lord gave to every man. He said, I have planted Apollos water. But God gave the increase. Church growth is not only a spiritual matter. Church growth is social, practical dimension. Church growth is not only the act of God. Church growth is also the act of men. It's not a spiritual matter alone. 
It's a social practical dimension. It's not only the act of God, it's also the act of man. The word church growth simply means the conversion of souls, the integration of souls into the church, and turning souls into reproductive, fruitful, reliable, dependable members. Church growth involves the conversion of souls, integration of souls into the church, and turning these souls into reproductive, fruitful, reliable, dependable members. Donna McAvran said that all that is involved in bringing men and women into a personal relationship with Christ and making them responsible church members is what is church growth. The conversion of souls, making them responsible Christians to Christ and to the church and to make them to be reproductive is church growth. So in this seminar we are looking at the seven practical things you need to do for church growth. Number one, personal growth. Grow yourself. No church can grow beyond the level of its members. Its members, its workers, and its leaders. Church grow because members grow, leaders grow, and workers grow. But hear me, sir. The cumulative growth of these people, the members, the leaders, the church worker, is at the mercy of the personal growth of the visionaire. Like human development requires natural growth. So also, when you feed the people effectively, they will naturally grow in the things of the spirit. When you are not growing well, your church will not grow well. If your church is only prophecy and miracles, you are not growing well. You are building the people on gifts and not on the word. You are not growing well. People who join church because of gifts and miracle are not responsible people in the things of the spirit. When the cheeks are down, they will change and follow another latest miracle worker. People who stay and grow a church with you are people who have grown in the word. Your personal growth is very important. And your personal growth is in five dimensions. Your spiritual growth. Growing in the Lord. Growing in the things of the spirit. Growing in the depths of scriptures. Growing in revelations. Is spiritual growth. The second dimension is intellectual growth. Growth in knowledge. By books and by informations. The next growth is emotional growth. Growth in feelings. You need some level of emotional stability to grow. He said, be still and know that I am the Lord. If you are not still, there are growth you can't experience. Many, of, many pastors have driven members because of emotional instability. They come, if you vex on the altar, you scatter everything. Vocational growth. There's difference between when you grow in the world and when you grow in your vocation your vocation is pastoring how much 
much of pastoring do you know? What we are doing now is vocational growth. In this seminar, we are growing you in your career as a pastor. Knowing the Bible does not make you a successful pastor. You must have information on what it takes to pastor. That is what we call vocational growth. Don't avoid pastor seminars and pastor trainings. Especially those of you who have not gone to Bible school. Always attend pastor's trainings. And let me tell you, if a doctor graduated 10 years ago and does not go to seminars for new information, new, for new, uh, about new diseases that came into town, new drugs that can tackle certain disease, that pastor will be an obsolete pastor. So also, you may have finished Bible school 10 years ago, 5 years ago, does not make you relevant. Hear what Apostle Paul said. He says, seek to be relevant. Don't seek to reign. If it's raining, we have rain. It is not in raining, it is in relevance. And the only way you can be relevant is when you grow in your career. Grow in pastoring. The things you knew last year should not be the same thing you should know this year. You should know more than what you knew last year. So buy books about pastoring. Buy books about counseling. Buy books about financing in ministry. Buy other materials. Pastoring without tears. Price I must pay to grow a church. All of this information. They are not inside Bible. Though they are there, but they are not direct. Somebody found it and throw light and expand. Became versatile in knowledge. So go and grow your vocation if you are a full-time pastor. The next thing, sir. You must have our social growth. You must grow outside church relationship. You must be approachable. You must know how to treat people. You must grow socially. You must be well exposed. That's why I, I want pastors to travel. Don't be a local pastor. Traveling sometimes is education. It makes you to be exposed socially. There are too many timid pastors, local pastors. Some pastors, they are dressing alone. It's a sign that they are not they are, they are not exposed. Call a riot on the altar. And some people come to church and say, this is not my kind. So please, be socially educative. There are facts you need to know about your personal development. Number one fact. Who you are determines who, you will, who will come to your church. Who you are determines who will come to your church? Show me the kind of people that are coming to your church. I tell you who you are. You like judgmental prayers. You will be full. Of, you have members that are full of judgmental. If you are a pastor that rely on gifts, you have members so much that rely on gifts. Get ready for crazy poverty. Because you don't teach them intelligent walking and wise walking. Don't teach members only to be spiritual. Teach members also to be useful with their hands. After COVID, I changed syllabus. I downgraded prophesying and downgraded uh, uh, miracles. I began to emphasize my original call. That doesn't mean I don't do them. I do them. Because a time came, I had thousands of people. They were a useless crowd. Because any trial, they will abandon you. They change church like rapper. When I hear some pastors, they are raining in Abuja, I laugh. Because we rain also. We are thousands we gather. You are the in team. Don't be deceived. If you do not know church these people into the pattern my son just talked about, my friend, you will end up with nothing. 
Who you are determines who will come to your church. Number two facts. Who you are will determine the level of growth of your church. Who you are will determine the level of the growth of your church. If you don't grow inside, your church won't grow outside. So seek to grow inside to grow your church. And as you grow, at every stage you grow, station somebody who understands that stage so that when your convert comes, you know, my church management board sat with some of my choir people who are misbehaving. And my wife came last night and said to me, I think you went too far. You forgot to teach some of them the elementary things. I said, boss, I'm pastoring for over 30 years. So how will I come back to foundational matters? She said, because we did not station people at every stage we pass. So that when people come, you train them from that stage till they meet me where I am. You have gone far. But you did not take them. So you wanted to move. And that is why most of them, you didn't check even if they are evil Christians. What is your relationship with God? You are telling them how to stay with the Holy Ghost 30 hours. Do they even know how to stay with the Holy Ghost one minute? So I missed something. And I sat down last night. She was sleeping. But I was awake. I was meditating on this truth. Meditating on this truth. So I made up my mind that that is the missing link. I must station people at every stage as I am growing. Because my personal growth is not their growth. Otherwise, if you want somebody to grow overnight, you burn a child. You tell them, put the child on top of the tree. Say you should jump. Did you start jumping from the tree like that? No. So if you cannot take time to teach them how to walk and fall. Station people at every stage. Put a system and a structure that will grow them into that system. Into that stage until they meet you where you are. Somebody shout, I hear. I hear. Another fact, number three fact is who you are is who you attract. You attract who you are. You don't attract what you want. You attract who you are. You don't attract what you desire. You attract who you are. Many of you want rich people, but are you rich in mind? Are you rich in words? Rich people can't come to your church because you beg too much. Every project, you will pursue them. Number five, who you are is who you will retain. Who you are is who you will retain. So if you can't retain certain people, it is because you are not at that level. There are some people that will come that they will stay because what to retain them, you don't have it. What to keep them, you don't have it. Every day you are shouting, ooh, ooh, damn, the Lord shall bless you, bow, heaven shall bless you, bow, your breakthrough is coming, bow, next day again, your favor is coming, bow, breakthrough is coming, bow, you will not die like that, bow, next month again, you, they will say, ah, ah, I want somebody to talk to me, tell me something that I can use to control my organization. Tell me something I can use to control my marriage. Tell me something that I can use to settle and break through my battleground. I can see that this pastor is going nowhere. Am I talking to somebody here? Yes, sir. Don't casualize your altar. There are pastors I invite, even sons to preach, they run away. Not because they don't want to preach. When it dawns on them, what they will come and face here? They will decline at the dying minute. Who you are is who you will produce. Who you are is who you will produce. So be very careful. Whenever your members are looking one kind, ask yourself, am I one kind? Check your life before you advance excuses. All of you who advance excuses is a sign you are not growing. Any pastor 
who advances excuses why his church is not growing. He said, my church is not growing because the people are not givers. The people don't pay tight. The people are like that. And they don't come. The people, eh, if you don't do this, they will not do this. The people, eh, the church is not growing because I'm the only giver. They don't tight. They don't, ah, ah. Instead of you spending time to train them, teach them the word of God, you are spending time advancing excuses. My friend, you can never grow church more than who you are. Personal growth. Number two, apart from growing yourself, which is personal growth, number two ingredients is relational growth. Relational growth. Grow your relationship. Impression matters in all things we do in life. When people come to your church, what kind of impression do they get? Grow in your relationship. Did they, did, did, they, did they find an atmosphere that is accepted? Did they find acceptance? Are they welcome? Are they, are they rejected? Are you hospitable? Did they feel condemned? Are you mean? These are questions you should ask yourself. Is your church friendly or is it unfriendly? Is your church homely or is homesick? So, it's very important. What is your relationship with people? How, does, how do you relate with people? It affects the growth of your church. Healthy relationship must exist in the church. A church that is infested with quarreling, infested with bickering, bigotry, misunderstanding, carnality, that church hatred, unresolved crisis, animosity, issues, unforgiveness, malice among members, among church workers, among leaders, child of God. That church can never grow. That church can never grow. Let me shock you, sir. Anytime the voices of men in your church are louder than the voice of God, that church will never grow. When men's voice speak louder, when people come to your church, do they hear God's voice? Do they hear the altar speaking? Or there are people in the church. All they do is to run down the system with their mouth. Pray them out. You either teach them or you pray them out. You must choose one. People come and stay in church based on how they have been treated. Hear me, sir. You must treat people kindly and in love. Don't treat them as if they are worse sinners. Love is like a sweet smelling aroma. I'm telling you. When you love people, they know love is contagious. Well, hate is a bad odor. Hate is a bad odor. It can smell anywhere. People know when you don't like them. Let me tell you, hate has a mysterious odor. Anywhere. It can smell in the church. It can smell in an office. I'm telling you. To retain people in the church, you must repel hatred. Acts chapter 11 verse 22. Acts 11, 22 to 24. Flash it. Acts 11, 22, 24. Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go for, go as far as Antioch. Next. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God and has seen the grace of God, was glad and exalted them all, that with purpose of heart, they will cleave unto the Lord. Next verse. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people were what was added unto the Lord. And they sent Barnabas to check the church of Antioch. The Bible says he found the grace of God at work. The people were glad. The people love God. He exalted them. They are, he exalted them to be a purposeful in heart to love the Lord. And the Bible said, the man who pastored them also, he saw his heart towards God. Hear this, sir. There are facts you need to take down right now. That has to do with relational growth. Number one, it takes good soil to grow good fruits. It takes good soil to grow good fruits. 
Hear me, sir. Your church must be a good soil. So that when you plant the seed in the hearts of people, it will grow. Number two, the atmosphere of your church will determine the level of its growth. What kind of atmosphere do we have? Is your atmosphere saturated with the Holy Ghost? Is it saturated with worship? Or there is this dryness in the air? Anytime there is a visible dryness in the air of a church, it's a reflection of the dryness of the pastor. It's a reflection of the dryness of the pastor. Let there be such an atmosphere that is godly, an atmosphere that is holy. People should not come here and do anything anyhow they want. People should not do things and get away with. Don't do that. You say, if I do that, they leave the church. It is better to have two people that you are standing on principles of the world. When the right people start coming and see principles, they will stay. That to manage these two people, manage these ten people, and then lose the thousands, you have opportunity to bring in. Sir, another fact is we will experience unhealthy growth. It's a fact. So anytime your church is unhealthy, just know that you will have an unhealthy growth. So work on the health of your church. The spiritual health of the church. The emotional health of the church. Everybody must be at peace with one another. Fight against animosity. People who don't talk to each other. Preach deliberate message. Bring unity among the people. And the love of Jesus permeating the atmosphere. Hmm. One fact you must know is that God can never add to or grow unhealthy. We never add to an unhealthy soil. He will never add or grow an unhealthy church. God will never do that. That's why when your church is unhealthy, people become, begin to devise uh, uh, ways to grow their church. And anything that is not gotten by right, you will leave it in the midst of your days. At the end, you will die like a fool. A church where good relationship exists, it will experience good growth. So, let there be good relationship between your church workers, good relationship between your HODs, your, your caretaker pastors, there must be a good relationship. Take time to resolve crisis and kill them. Take time to project the, opt the objective, the objectivity of your church and the object of pursuit. What should be more important in the church? Let the people be focused at it. Let the flesh be dead in the cravings, the appetites, and the details of the flesh. Let them be dead in your church. The next, number three ingredient is functional growth. Personal growth, relations growth. Now we're talking about functional growth. Grow your approach and method. Grow your approach and your method. Doing the same thing the same way always brings same results. Therefore, if you want your church to grow, you must change how you do things. Growth requires a change, and change will lead to growth. Growth de desires requires a change, and change leads to growth. So, sir, you must understand these things. That church must have dynamic, must have competent, efficient, and effective church workers, dynamic church leaders, dynamic ministers, ongoing training is necessary. You must train church workers, spend more time in training church workers than in doing programs. Spend more time in working on the health of the church than in doing programs. Sir, anointing without training we end up in frustration. Anointing without training will stagnate your work. I've seen many people that rose in ministry like fire service, but no training. As your church is growing, so should your training capacity be growing. Because if you don't train the people, you don't change approach and method, your church will be stagnant. New wine must be kept in new wine skin, not in old wine skin. Luke 5 and verse 38. Your church must act contemporarily to catch up with contemporary lost souls. 
you must act contemporarily to catch up with contemporary lost souls. What does it mean? There are methods of preachings that were applicable in the 80s and 90s, in the 2000s, that are not applicable now. Number one, long preaching is not applicable now. No matter how we want to train the people, we must break it in sections. Number two, you must check the quality of your crowd. What are their age? What are their age? You have bombers. You have the X. You have the Y. You have the Z generations. What kind of congregations do you have? So that the way we win the bombers is not the same way we win, we win the Z generation. The kind of message that breaks the X generation may never break the Y generations. And so you must check which kind of generations you have. The bombers are the ones born in the 60s and in the early 70s. From 75 or 74, 73 upward to 85, they are the X generation. Those born from 86 to 99, 2000, they are the one that are called the Y generation. The 2001 to the 2000 and now, they are the one that are called the Z generations. So what kind of people do you have? Zero hour message is good for boomers and X generations. You must come with contemporary topics. You must have you day out, single day out. There are things you do in contemporary church that can also grow the church. When you do music concert, it's not applicable to boomers. Boomers don't enjoy it. X generation don't enjoy it. But the Y and Z generation enjoy it. Any song you raise in your church every Sunday, just as I am without one plea, must I go and empty handed so I cherish this old rugged cross. <laughs> Boomers will cry. X generation will cry. The Y generation will pinch in his phones and his, and his easy. Z generation, they'll be punching their phone. For example, praise and worship. Angel are singing, you are worthy, O oh Lord. Worthy, you are worthy, O oh Lord. <laughs> Bomas has entered third heaven. X generation is about to enter the third heaven. You just begin, you are worthy. The Y generation, you are worthy. Oh Lord, but sing a song. Ooh, 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 ah, ooh, 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 yeah, ah, ooh, ah, hey, hey. You see Z, he has started. The bombers will put his two hands in his pocket. <laughs> now, what are you to do as a pastor, pastoring a contemporary church? You mix both. Call your music people. You sing to bombers and sing to contemporaries. Am I talking to somebody here? Make the music clear. Somebody shout, I hear. I hear. Somebody shout, I hear. I hear. So, it is not doing the same program over and over that grows a church. This program you are doing, how has it benefited the people? You did a program, there was no growth. You brought a pastor there was no growth. Science should tell you that that method doesn't work. Change it. It may just be uh, what we call uh, social, what do you call it? Community development program. It's all you needed to grow that church. Give to your community. 
Get your doctors together and do free medical something. That opens the heart of the community. Give them food to eat. That can open the heart of the community than 10,000 messages you preach. Than 1,000 billboards. I discovered I used millions for billboards almost every month. So I changed. I just used the money for billboard and give the people food. Because the people are hungry. They, are, they need to eat to serve God. So please, change your approach and change your method if church must grow. No one has it all. So you can learn from others. Watch other growing church, what they do to grow their church. And it's not every principle you must imbibe. Number four, ingredient is sociological growth. Grow your status. What is your status? And what is the status of your members? Your church must identify and determine the types of people you wish to reach. In your church, what kind of people come to your church? There are some sons church I went to. I don't like going there because it's a mixed multitude. A mixed multitude is, how's that call it, the faduka. You don't know the direction of the church. People who have sanity will not sit in that church too long. Because it is not clear to them. What kind of people are you called to pastor? If you are called to educated people, don't be running church like a market people. If you are called to market people, don't be running church like educated people. So you must check the caliber of people you are called. Nobody is called to everybody. And if you are called to cut across some sections of people, you must increase your status to be able to cut across these sections of people. There are facts you need to know about this. Who you are will determine who you will attract. I've said that before. Unless you believe in yourself, nobody will believe in your gospel. You must know what you are called to do. Don't operate church like a poverty church if you want to attract rich people. Don't make them look like you are begging them for money every day. Let them see things happening. And don't be collecting money for things you know you will not do. We need light. You collect money. They didn't see light. We need transformer. You collect money. They didn't see transformer. We need to build. You collect the money. They didn't see one cement anywhere. Responsible people will never trust you. And responsible people will never be around you. Because you cannot be trusted. So increase your status. Let your personality be, be, be such that people can go to the market with and buy. People, people want to have a pastor they can trust and talk about. You are a pastor, you borrow from all your members. Borrow me this, borrow me this. You borrow all their cars. Stop collecting cars of members. Manage the only car you have. The only time members' cars should be taken is when there are guest ministers. Not for you to be driving members' cars. You are irresponsible and you have irresponsible members. Stop going to their shop and collecting suits and shoes and collecting things that you will not pay. When your character is bad, the work of God in your hand will not grow. So, grow your sociological status. It's very important. Your mission statement, your programs, your, your activities, your worship style, your preaching style, your singing style, determines the kind of people that will come to your church. Recently, we sing a particular tribe songs. And other tribes are getting uncomfortable in church. So I've assigned all the musicians and those song leaders that you must mix the songs. You must mix the songs so that the church is not for one tribe. It's for all tribes. So it's very important. 
that all of these things must be taken to note. Then the next thing you must grow is you must have economical growth. Grow your income and outcome. A giving church is a growing church. A stingy church is a retarding church. The economic condition of a church is not measured by the amount they contribute every service alone. But it's, by the, it's, it's judged by the amount of working class. Working class people. Encourage them to work. Stop gathering young men around you. Doing nothing from morning to night. Release them to go and work. Let them find job to do. It is better you have part time voluntary workers. That you have 15 young men around you. If they are wearing suit, doing not, you are wasting destiny and potential. They will not like you after some years. Because you use their 10 years and 15 years to waste them. Teach them. If you can drive, drive. Stop looking for driver. Whom a young man, you are wasting his life driving you. Let him do other productive things. Stop putting them around the office. Send them away to go and walk. Let them go and start business. And bring it. Is that clear? It's very important. So hear me. Your income is not based on how much you take. If this thing done on me the hard way. I discover that even if I take offering 10 times on Sunday. There is an amount I will never get. So those four offerings. Those three offerings are a waste of time. It's a waste of time. I'm telling you this truth. I have it by experience. And I understand why people take one offering or at most two offerings. I understand why. Because if, if you take five offerings, there's a certain amount you will never get. You have already pegged yourself. And from that level, you start going down. Do things that will make people to be working, working class people, going to office, doing things productive in their hands. Teach your people to be working class people and teach them giving. You heard what he said. A young man joined the church. And the next thing he said, I am from so, so, so place. I just joined. Well, is there anything you want me to do? I can't see my pastor without an offering. He dropped an offering. He must be taught. He must have been taught somewhere. Especially middle beds. If you are pastoring middle bed and you are pastoring in northern state, get ready for suffering if you can't teach them. I went to Port Harcourt. Any house I entered to pray those days, and envelopes, they give me, I said, ah, ah. Ministry is sweet. Everywhere you go, they're giving you an envelope. They go to the north. Preach. They will start prayer. The God who brought you safely. May that God take you back safely. I discover the reason is because there is no teaching. We must teach the people to give. Don't assume they know. Teach them consciously. Can I shock you, sir? Yes. Growth requires giving. I hear you. Growth requires giving, not just wishing. The entire church was a giving church in the New Testament. Acts chapter 2 verse 45. Acts chapter 4 verse 34 to 37. Acts chapter 9 verse 36. Acts chapter 16 verse 14 to 15. They were a giving church. The members of the early church were owners of properties and they were givers. They gave internally, locally and they gave globally. The church in the, old, in the New Testament all through scripture, they were dangerous givers. So please grow the economic dimension of your church by growing the income by teaching them how to give and all workers by looking for what to do with their hands. Don't gather a bunch of long men. You are not training them for ministry. Neither are you training them to be useful to themselves. It is not healthy. So facts you must know right now about, about economy uh, growth. Give, giving will open your church to blessing of growth. Giving will open your church to the blessing of growth. Next thing you need to know is that your church... 
must cultivate the heart of the heart, habit of giving. Please don't sow, don't, 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 I don't tell them to sow by manipulation. Don't tell them to sow by prophecy and manipulating them when you have not heard. Because if they get to know, they won't like you. Recently, one of my sons manipulated somebody to give a seed. If I did not see that person and explain to him in details, I was already losing that person. Another of my sons almost drive for me four useful people, very important people. Four useful people in the church. I didn't know he secretly, one of them collected $37,000. He took God for me to restore that person. $37,000. For me to restore that person. He took God. Next point you need to know under facts. Show me a blessed member. I will show you a giving member. So teach them giving. Show me a blessed church. I will show you a giving church. Your church must be a giving church. You must give. I sacrifice four times a year to my mentors and fathers. I did in January. When we had to start this church building in March, I again emptied the account. Just yesterday again, I'm hearing the spirit talking to me again. At the end of this anniversary of our church, if we must move to the next stage. So you must be a giving man of God and a giving church. It's very important. Number six, technological growth. Grow your technology. The goal of any church is to, to reach the world. You cannot accomplish this without the Holy Spirit, with, with the Holy Spirit and anointing alone. You cannot. You need technology. Churches must be interested in reaching others, not only within the four walls of your church. Right now, I pastor people, not only the ones that sit here. I pastor people around 40 nations of the world who must listen to me every time. Even when they go to church, they come back. They must replay my message. Nothing less than 5,000 people replay my messages to hear it. To build their life. The reason is because of technology. Every church needs a website. Every church needs Facebook. Every church needs Instagram. Every church needs TikTok. Every church needs Twitter, emails. You need it to discharge information about your church. No matter how small your church is, have these things. You must grow in technology. Facts you must know. The, hear me. The church must use every means to reach the outside world. Use every means. Grow in that dimension. Use technology to announce your programs and invite people. Invest in and make good use of modern te uh, technology to advertise social media. PA system, TV monitors, projectors to enhance your growth because the Y generation and the Z generation will not be comfortable in your church if there are no systems like this because they are not trained, their mind is not trained to look at things in one way. They look at things in more than two ways and the Z look at things in four ways. So sometimes they will look at you, sometimes they will look here, they will look here, they look at the one close to them. Make sure all of these things, these gadgets are in place. It relaxes the Z generation to focus a little longer. The size of your church is going to be at the mercy of the technology advancement of your church. So please, it doesn't matter who you are. Grow. Grow your Facebook. Grow your Instagram. Take time to grow it. Don't say it doesn't matter. It matters. You are not called only to, to locally. You are called. Your message is needed internationally. Put your messages on YouTube. Advertise it. Somebody will stumble one day. 
The day God will announce you, people want to fall back to check you out. Number seven, which is the last for this session, structural growth. Structural growth. What does it mean? Grow in your inlook and outlook. Structural growth. Grow in your inlook and outlook. Your church must have a dynamic structure that will enhance growth. By structure, I mean organization. I mean environment. They shouldn't be crossing gutter to your church. Don't use retire things to fence the church. And let me tell you, this structure in this white two-day compliant church has grown church even more than anointed. There are pastors where you hear them preach. They have no business being in ministry, but they have thousands of people because of structure. Environment, the ambience is cozy. The ambience is fine. The, the instrument is not harassing and quick, 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 quick. I kept hearing this thing quick with all the Alana Rays aboard. I told the two guys, get ready to go on retirement. After this conference, you will not be needed. If I hear one quick, 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 just get ready. Your letter of uh, sack is already written. I have signed it, waiting. Just get ready. If I hear quick again, you are not needed at all. So people should be comfortable. The sound must be clear. Pastor must not shout too much for the people to hear you. The instrument must be very clear and distinctive. The voices must be clear. The sound must be, the voice singers, their voice must be parted. Let it look as if they are in a theater. At the same time, good word, good song. People should not be blowing fan in your church. Everyone must be cool. Everyone must be well taken care of. Please, it affects your growth. And the play structure shows whether your church is orderly or not. This orderliness is lack of structure. This orderliness. People come and sit anywhere they want. It's not their father's parlor. They must come and sit where the ushers direct them. Teach your members how to be obedient to directions and instructions. Why did Nebuchadnezzar seek for the king's seat? He said to the priests of the union, look among the children of the slaves. Choose for me those who are the king's seed. Those who understand science. Those who are intelligent. Bring them and train them after our custom so that they could carry out our mandates. Why is he looking for the king's seed among many things? Because the king's seeds have been trained and have been taught morality, have been taught systems and structures. It is easy to impart knowledge into them. Don't gather market people in your church. You won't grow it. Everybody does anyhow. Pastor is talking while we shout, shout hallelujah five times. Hallelujah. If you say that, you will find yourself outside in this place. I want to preach. You start. Siri, Kauri, Lauri, 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 Lauri. Thou servant of the Lord. You shall not preach now. I have something to say. That is the last time you'll be in this church. <laughs> Prophets are ruling your church. One native doctor with familiar spirit is prophesying. People are seeing all manner of vision. There is one in a department always seeing vision. Always seeing spirit. I call and say, you are fired from that department. Move to prayer force. We will deliver you from there. Then we'll know where to send you back again. Go to prayer force immediately. I don't want to see you in that department. You say, yes, sir. Because you are, you are dispensing a strange spirit in that department. The leaders have been trained to know who has a wrong spirit and must not be allowed to continue. So train the people about structure. People should not just walk anyhow when the word of God is being preached. Everything should be decently and in order. It enhances growth. Nothing grows in an unstructured church. 
Nothing grows in an unorganized church. Sir, Paul said, until I come, put everything in order. First Corinthians 14, 14. But be sure that everything is done properly and in order. The New Living Bible said it. First Corinthians 14, 14 and verse 40. The size of the church does not determine its growth. Rather, it is the way things are done that determines the growth of that church. Be sure that everything is done properly and everything is done in order. I pray for every pastor. I receive, receive grace to do things in order in the name of Jesus. Amen. Facts you must take about structure is that cleanliness is next to godliness. Stop having altar full of anointing oil, map of Africa, map of Nigeria on your altar. One part of the altar is smelling because they pour water. They do design on the altar, all kinds of things. Everywhere, your instrument, the part of the speaker has fallen down. Half of the ceiling there on your altar is on the floor. Clean people, cozy people will never come to your church. So please, even if you don't have all the money in this world, that little place, make it the finest place. Because how you plan and organize your church is one of the key factors for growth. How do you plan your weekly program? Your Sunday program? Your Sunday school classes. Most importantly, the children and teenager class. What program do you have for them? I have told them the, the building they are building, there must be teenagers classes. I have dedicated an entire building for the teenagers and I make sure, I mean for the children department, I make sure each room have AC. You pack the place, make it look like a school. Very beautiful and cozy. It's very important. Because your church will grow. When, you, when the children go there. And they will tell their parents. That is the church they want. If they are going to another church. The children will start crying in the car. They will manage to go. The children cry. They cry the one Sunday. Next Sunday they cry. Every time they say. Is this church you want to go? Is this church you want to go? Very soon the parents will tilt towards that child. May will betide you, the, your, your church member carry their children for baby dedication somewhere. And those children went to Sunday school somewhere. Mommy, is that place you want to go? That's another way of losing uh, uh, members to your church. You lose members in your church. Now, what is your program in welcoming newcomers? How are newcomers visited? What is the structure? Is it the place where you welcome newcomers? Is it messy? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it beautiful? Is it anyhow? Teach the people to make that place cozy. It's very important. The orderliness of your, of your leaders, your church workers in welcoming the people. What do they say to the people? Have you sent people to check what they say to them? In Joss, I put a young man to be rounding up uh, what they call it, Sunday school. Uh -uh. Two or three people told me, sir, because I'll be in the office praying. They told me, sir, the thing this man says at the beginning, he always takes 10 minutes to share before we go into our classes. And when we come, the thing is, he doesn't look like a loyal person. So I didn't inform him. So I came and sat down. He didn't know I was there, but I was there. I had him talk. I had him close the Sunday school. And I called him to the office. I said, this is the last time you hold this microphone to talk. You will sit there and you will have to be retrained. So what did I do? I said, the way you talk doesn't represent this vision. He got angry and left the church. I told him, bye-bye. I continued. Many years ago, I met him. He said, I have come. I have learned so hard way. I said, you have learned hard way. He said, yes. I met him in Abuja. I said, okay, sit down. He sit down again. He's waiting for me to give him microphone. He says, sir, the anointing is 
born in. I said, there is market here. I, I used to go to market, 68 market. I'll carry you where there is, where you can burn the anointing. You can't burn it here. You can't burn it here. Before you know, he left again. Three years after, he brought a woman that is looking like a Somali refugee. He says his wife. People who don't have pastors and mentors, their life is scattered. To cut the long story short, the next time he was in the hospital, he said, it's a cancer. I should send him money. I said, which money did you give me to send to you? He said, sorry, sir. I said, is he a right or what? He said, it's not a right. I'm begging for my life. So I asked them to give him 100,000. To cut the long story short, I don't know about it. The next thing I heard is gone to eternity. These people, are, they just move anyhow. They are rolling stone with that moisture. So they invite all manner of attacks into their lives. Please, don't allow people bring their disorderliness into an orderly system. Get them down. Somebody told me, I'm a pastor. Must I do foundation membership classes? So how will you know about this ministry? What, are, what, what? Where did you come from? He said, I said, my friend, go to foundation membership class quickly. Whether you're a pastor, you're a pope, you're a bishop, you must go there. It's our system of thought teaching you for seven weeks. After seven weeks, we will accept you. Last Sunday, we accepted 42 people and gave them certificates. That certificate confirms that you, are, you know what Shepherd's house is all about. If it was before, I would be doing miracle, prophesy from front to back, everywhere. My Wednesday back till outside. But it's a useless crowd. They are not committed to anything. Most of them leave their churches that is orderly and come and help you to be disordered. And when they have good money, they will take it to orderly place. When they want to do something good that will attract orderly people, they will take it there. When they want a disorderly life, they will come to you. That, that should not be your life. And let me tell you, ministry is your life and you are growing. You are growing every day. Every year you are growing older. Every year you are growing older. You should not allow people to waste your existence. I speak to undernet pastors. How old are you, say 40? How old are you, 39? How old are you, 32? I said, this is like a joke. 10 years ago, you were not that age. Now you are in this age. And you are still playing. You will be a useless old man not too long from now. That is why old men who are useless, I don't pity them. Because they had a useless youthful age. One man was serving Archbishop in the plane. Nigerian Airways. Bishop Depot was by his side. His hands were shaking. To serve tea. He brought the tea because his hands were shaking. The tea failed. Abishua said, Give me another one. So the boy asked him, said, Papa, don't you think this man is too old? He should be retiring now. He said, Tell him to serve me tea. What was he doing in his youthful age? If he has wasted it, he will have a regrettable old age. Now, ministries like that, don't squander it. You cannot always go around, you cannot always be strong, you cannot always be powerful. Begin to duplicate yourself in people. Begin to teach them the counsel of God. Take ministry very serious. Whether you like it or not, younger people are coming up. You think you are young. Wait. The 20s, the 30s, they are coming up. They are also devising a more better way, a more faster way of doing ministry and accomplishing things. All you'll be doing is growing in age without being relevant to your generation. So please... Put structure in your system before your, your work before it gets too late. No ministry grows without clean and clear structure. I have been there. I have functioned in heavy anointing. The structure finished me. So I have to come back to it. Don't waste your energy if you don't have structure. Put structure in place because it's structure that carries the, the glory of the anointing. Otherwise the anointing will be wasted. The glory of the anointing will turn to glory. It will turn to reproach. When glory is not well harnessed by structure, it will turn to your cause and your limitation. I pray for somebody here. I receive it. Receive grace in the name of Jesus Amen. to build structure. Amen. Receive grace in the name of Jesus Amen. to build an economic life Amen. for your church 
and for yourself. Receive grace to grow socially in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive grace to grow in your relationship in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive grace to grow personally in the mighty name of Jesus. Capacity to grow deeper and deeper in God in the name of Jesus. Rise on your feet and let's begin to pray and begin to ask God to give us grace to grow. Grace to grow his work in our hands. Grace to grow his work in our hands. Recata palato sete, le bando cosita, regando balago dosa, racata saprotos capia tala bradagas, seco tala preya da gabosa, le pota capala gatosa, la braga dosa cala bradaga la baza, e la cote balaga dosa, mambro se capala gatosa, recata la bradaga balaga dosa, mambro se cala bradaga baza, e pro se prate capala gatos, seco la bradaga balaga E cala branda cala bazanda, la bruxa cala bara cala bazanda, la branda cala bara 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 bara
are the land. You are the land. Upon. You are the land. Upon. You are the land. Upon the throne. Lay hands on your head. I speak it to your life. I receive it. The discipline and the patience. To stay in these three days Amen. until something rises from your spirit. Amen. I release it upon you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The ability to see the big picture about your ministry. Amen. About your callings. Amen. Amen. About your elections. Yep. Amen. I command that ability. Release in the name of Jesus. Amen. May your heart indict a good matter. Amen. May light flood into your spirit. Amen. I quicken you. Amen. I quicken you. Amen. I quicken you. Amen. For growth. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Shout that name loud and clear. Amen. Give the Lord a clap and take your seat for a minute. Tomorrow, we shall be looking at the pastor's prize for growth. And we shall be looking at the minister and his life. Pastor's prize for growth, Reverend Dr. Philip will be here to take it. Reverend Chidi Okora will also be here to take the minister and his life. Apostle Paul will be here also to also take, and I will take. Give the Lord a clap offering for that. So tomorrow we'll be having four sections. At the end of this teaching, we will give you a certificate that you have gone through these courses and this school of ministry and you keep them. It's a sign that you've opened your spirit. And also people who lack ordinations, people who lack license to preach, we have forms for you to fill. And we will have letters that we will need from you so that we can work on your ordinations and licenses. We need three months to work on you and to look at you properly. And after that, the next school of ministry will be ready to pour the oil. So we tell you all the requirements. And those who are called to apostleship, We'll check all, all of these things and work on them. Those who need upgrade, independent ministry, to a full blast reverend, we'll look all of these things and see how we can work on them. The important thing is anything that will make you effective, we'll give you the apparatus to help you become effective in ministry. So I would like you to take time to register. Register. And uh, also fill all of the details they will require from you. And uh, have your talk. Because in the evening is the anniversary celebration. We're having the voice of the prophet running in the evening. And the theme is the rising of giants. Give the Lord a clap offering. Each of that night, each of the night, I'll be coming with 15 minutes message on the rising of giants. And then allow the guest speakers also minister. So tonight will be loaded. We start by 5.30 and we will close by 8 o'clock. So I would like every one of you to be around. The moment we see your tag, we will take you to a special seat reserved for you. So please take note and the Lord will bless you. There's uh, a canteen at the third floor of the church administrative floor. There's a canteen there. You can buy any food of your choice. The caterer have been hired. And for an affordable price, just go to the canteen, eat, pay, and enjoy yourself. Water, drink, everything is there. It's very important. Everybody should register for three, five. But if you want all the materials that will be taught here, at, on Friday, we are giving you all the materials that we have taught here so that you can go home with them and see. So every speaker that share their materials have been put together 
the, with the one I am teaching, I already have my materials. I have about 10 topics I'm treating personally with you. And uh, I am going to go more academic and as we get to Friday, I'll go spiritual. It's very important. Well, I allow others. Pastor Philip also is going to go academic a little. That the rest, we want them to go spiritual. Reverend Chidi, Apostle Paul Odola, they will go that dimension. So we'll just be building and continuing so that you will have multifaceted outlook to what it takes to grow a church. I see you going higher Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. If there are pastors in this city, you know, encourage them to be here tonight and tomorrow. We start exactly 9.30 with 10 to 15 minutes intercession. After that, the lectures begin. So don't always stay outside when you are within this environment. Once it is time for any teaching, please don't stay outside. It's not permitted. It's part of our structure. You are either here or you are not in this environment. So once you hear praise and worship, leave whatever you are doing and just come into the hall and let's enjoy Jesus together. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Quickly, let's lift our offerings wherever you are. As soon as we share the grace, uh, the offering basket will be in front. You just drop it and then you are free to to go take some recess. And there are cheap hotels. When you get to the, uh, the, uh, the information desk, they can tell you hotels you can get very cheap. And uh, by November, we, have, we are building a, what they call it, service apartment. The entire three buildings, each of these buildings has eight flats. So we are, doing, we are taking about uh, 24, 24, eight times three is 24, I guess, so you have 24 flats and you have more than 48 rooms. It's going to be a guest house. So when you come in November, you can also take a room there and just be around the environment. And the Lord will bless yours. Somebody shout amen. So for you to own all the materials and CDs and a book from me, it's all going to cost you 10000 So you register for all the materials for that. You also register, you can either register for three five or register for ten thousand. Ten thousand gives you everything, all the full package. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lift that offering of Father. We bless every giver. We multiply seed so we command financial increase as we sow into this system that cannot fail. Bless every giver in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you for coming, every one of you. God bless you. Let's relax and enjoy Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now forevermore. Amen and amen. Feel free, come drop your offerings and greet one another. Mighty man of war, lion of Judah, we bow down and worship you. In World Aflame, God has raised firemen to fight fire with fire. It's a new era. It's a new revolution. Shepherd's House Assembly International Abuja presents Voice of the Prophet 2022 Theme The Rising of Giants. Ministry Dr. Joshua Tallinger, Pastor Seth Barr. 
Prophet Samson Amwate and Pastor Mrs. Jackit Alina. Date Wednesday 18th to Sunday 22nd May 2022. Time 5.30 p.m. daily. Special music ministration by Ada Ehi and Sami Oposo. Don't miss out on our Passion and Prophecy Night May edition on Friday 20th May 2022 by 9.30 p.m. till dawn. Also mark your calendar for our International School of Ministry. Date 18th to 20th May 2022 by 9 a.m. daily. Sunday 22nd May is the grand finale. First service 7 a.m. and second service 9.30 a.m. Venue, the Shepherd's House Assembly International Headquarters. Before ShopRite or Resettlement Junction, Apo Abuja, Nigeria. Come celebrate and praise the Lord with us. Host Dr. Joshua and Pastor Mrs. Jackie Tallinger. Jesus is Lord forever. Come, come. Pastor Winners is calling you. Hi. 